Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Nicole Cromarty, and I'm the Director of Education and Programs at the Clifford Still Museum. Tonight, we are thrilled to have Miranda Lash joining us from her office at the Museum of Contemporary Art, Denver. Miranda Lash is Ellen Bruss Senior Curator at the MCA. And now I would like to introduce our special guest. Throughout the run of our current exhibition, Stories We Tell, the collection Two Ways, we're inviting curators who have worked with Clifford Stills Art at some point in their careers to share their perspectives. Miranda Lash has served as the Ellen Bruss Senior Curator at the Museum of Contemporary Art Denver since uh, September of 2020. Prior to joining the MCA, Lash was Curator of Contemporary Art at the Speed Art Museum and the founding curator of Modern and Contemporary Art at the New Orleans Museum of Art. Lash previously worked at the Menil Collection in Houston, Texas, which, as some of you may know, holds several works by Clifford Still. Lash has been a Clark Fellow at the Clark Art Institute, a consultant for Creative Capital, a panelist for the National Endowment for the Arts, and a member of the Curatorial Advisory Council for the International Triennial Prospect New Orleans. She is a board member for the Joan Mitchell Foundation and a graduate of Harvard University and the Williams College Graduate Program in the History of Art. Tonight, Miranda will be speaking about her perspectives on PH247, painted in 1951, lovingly referred to by visitors and staff as Big Blue. Welcome and thank you so much for joining us tonight, Miranda. Hi, good evening. Hello, Nicole. Thank you so much for having me. So I want to begin by sharing my thanks to the Clifford Still Museum for inviting me to talk about this fantastic painting. Um, I've admired Clifford Still's work for years, and it's really a joy to be able to um, talk about such a, an ambitious and pivotal work in the collection. Um, so to begin our discussion of Big Blue, uh, I wanted it actually to be a larger discussion about blue and blue in general, the color, how do we think of blue and how do we understand color? And an argument I'm going to put forward through the course of this talk is for thinking of color as a culturally mediated phenomenon. In other words, our understanding of color is shaped by our, our individual experience and our cultural experience as well. And I think I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that this will augment and enhance our understanding of Clifford Still rather than limit it. So, the first slide I'd like to share um, is a vision of a night sky um, to evoke essentially my own first intense memory of blue. Um, blue is a color I've always been attracted to my entire life um, for its mysticism, for its sense of expansion. And the earliest memory I have of blue that really stood out for me was looking out into the night sky and seeing a color so intense between the stars that it just left me awestruck. I, I was a young child at the time. And I remember thinking this color is so intense. I will never be able to reproduce it anywhere. I will never cap, there will never be a crayon. There'll never be a picture that captures the intensity of the blue that I'm seeing right now looking up into the sky. So this image is really just an idea, an approximation. It is no way a reproduction. Um, but I wanted to conjure that memory of night sky for two reasons. One, um, I wanted to begin with the idea that as in our memories, as, along with great works of art, there is always a degree of the indescribable, the ineffable, um, something that surpasses, surpasses words and eludes description. That's what art is. If it wasn't that way, it would be a sentence or something far more didactic than the poeticism of art in its intrinsic form. And I begin by saying that um, to preface that although I am going to talk about issues of identity and culture, that is by no means the only way to think of art and by no means do I put it forward as a limiting factor. There are always aspects to artworks that can't be described, that can't be um, limited in that way. Um, secondly, I bring up the idea of the night sky because I think it informs your understanding of what I'm trying to describe when I say the night sky that I'm remembering was a night sky in the San Fernando Valley of Los Angeles and the circa the early 80s. And I say that because 
the night sky I'm picturing was one deeply uh, uh, colored or affected by a thousand, thousands and thousands of city lights, right? And passing helicopters and, you know, uh, spotlights coming out from the Hollywood Hills. So it's not the same night sky that someone um, in the mountains of Colorado would have seen. It's not the same night sky that someone on a, a, a terrace in Par Paris would have seen. It was the sky that I experienced from my specific vantage point. So how do we apply these two ideas, the ineffable and cultural specificity to a, a magnificent painting like Big Blue? Um, so I'll go, uh, next slide has Big Blue. Um, such a hard painting to encapsulate um, and so ambitious in scale. It's the largest one in the Clifford Still Museum's collection. Um, and even though uh, this, uh, the, the Clifford Still Museum's website does a fantastic job of digital reproductions, of course it can never fully encapsulate the subtleties of color and the liveliness of color that is in this painting. Why, um, this, this gets to a point I'm going to talk about as well, which is the physicality of painting. Um, because paintings are physical objects and not JPEGs or TIFFs, although they can be re reproduced as such, they're always interacting with light in real time. So in other words, when I saw Big Blue, there were subtleties in the tones of blue that simply cannot be reproduced digitally because they change at every any moment based off where I'm standing vis-a-vis -vis the painting, what time of day it is in the museum, what the you know the rooftop uh, blinds are are up to, and all of that. So that I think that physicality is actually very important um, to our discussion because it's another factor to consider in how we think about painting. Um, I, I will say I was deeply inspired in thinking about this painting by a quote by Still, I never wanted color to be color. I never wanted texture to be texture or images to be um, become shapes. I wanted them all to fuse into a living spirit. So in that sense, I'm going to take Clifford Still at his word. We're not gonna think of color as just color. Blue is not just blue. Blue is potentially much more. And we're gonna drill down into that. Um, so the next slide I'd like to share is two famous examples of blue um, to sort of get into the idea of the physicality of art that I, um, I'd like to explore for a minute. So you're seeing Giotto's Arena Chapel in Padua and Yves, Yves Klein's uh, Venus um, from the 1960s. So a work from the 15th century, a work from the 20th century. Um, I mentioned, I'm, I'm showing you these works because even within color, there's histories of color, right? And I'm showing you here two artworks that are both representative of the use of ultramarine. Ultramarine, as we know, has its own history. It was used as far back as the Egyptians, if not further, um, prized for its rarity. There was for a period of, for centuries, only one region of Afghanistan where it could be found. And so therefore its rarity and its intensity allowed it to be associated with preciousness, with the infinite, um, something that could not otherwise be replaced. So here you see Giotto using ultramarine to depict his dome of the heavens in the arena chapel, the preciousness of uh, the, the sacred stories of the life of, of Jesus. Um, and ultra, and uh, Yves Klein's quest to reproduce a synthetic ultramarine ultimately led him to um, create uh, international Klein blue. So I mentioned these histories in the sense that Although we think of color as this very abstract thing, blue is blue, even within histories of, even within the subset of blue, there are histories that are affected by trade routes, by colonization, by access, by expense. Um, who can afford to buy these colors? Um, we know, for example, that Vermeer practically bankrupted his family in pursuit of buying ultramarine. Um, and yet I, I do wanna, um, uh, pull out two quotes from, uh, that I love. One is from the Renaissance. So like Giotto, this is um, Cenuto Cellini describing blue as a noble color, beautiful, the most perfect of all colors. And um, Kandinsky putting forward the, the connoisseur of color, believing that the deeper the blue becomes, the more strongly it call, pulls man towards the infinite, awakening in him the desire for the pure and finally the supernatural. So I mention this because uh, arguably there is uh, a common thread across, across many cultures of associating blue with the divine, with the spiritual, with the otherworldly. And I'll drill into that further as well. Um, so as an art history student, physicality was a big draw to me for painting. Think, the term two-dimensional was so unsatisfying for me in thinking about paintings. I love looking at them 
uh, from the side. I love to stand to the side of paintings and see how much the paint pops off the canvas. Um, and also because painting, I think that that fusion of physicality and, and, and its aspiration historically to tell history is what makes it an incredibly, um, I would say resilient medium and ever evolving medium. Um, so next slide, please. Um, I want to couch my enthusiasm for painting with concerns for painting, right? So painting, as if any of you follow art, you may know that the death of painting or the potential death of painting has been declared many times. Uh, there's a perpetual fear that uh, there's no more left to invent, it's going to die out. Um, I mention this because uh, in the wake of, our, of, the, of abstract expressionism, um, there was this idea that because the abstract expressionists had pushed um, abstraction, quote unquote, to its furthest point, what was there left to explore? So you had therefore critics like Douglas Crimp in 1981 tolling the potential end of painting. Um, what is there, what stylistic evolutions remain? Um, how, is it, uh, how does it stack up to photography, which can rep reproduce things so much more quickly and so much more accurately? Um, and then all the way into the 2000s, this is a work, uh, an article from 2014 by the critic Walter Robinson, um, putting out the term zombie formalism. What do we do with all these paintings that are being uh, created in the 2010s? that are in a way mere shadows of the modernist uh, aspirations of uh, the abstract expressionists. It's formalism without meaning. It's formalism without aspiration. It's formalism that's being created solely for market purposes, solely to um, appease an insatiable art market and being churned out for that reason. So the idea of zombie formalism, a resuscitation of ideas that are no longer relevant. Um, now, I by, I by no means subscribe to the idea that painting is dead. I think painting is obviously alive and well in no small part because there are incredible figurative artists working in a figurative vein. For the purposes of my talk, I'd like to focus on abstraction and something I'd like to argue is that both of these uh, well-regarded and important pieces, which signal the potential death of painting, had not widened their lens sufficiently to incorporate the perspective of BIPOC artists onto abstract painting. Um, once the umbrella becomes wider, and once museums, art institutions, and the art market start to incorporate the perspective of BIPOC artists and how they approach formalism and geometric abstraction, suddenly we started realizing, wait a second, there are a lot more histories to tell. There's a lot more to say about abstraction. And um, uh, next slide, we could go to the next one. This is Diani Whitehawks. She gives Quiet Strength uh, 7 from 2020. Um, I want to talk about BIPOC artists' approach to abstraction in part because I believe that their pursuit of painting in these ways turns a lot of the tenets of modernism on its head in the sense that um, the tenets of modernism essentially argued artists like Clifford Still, like Marth Rothko, the abstract expressionists, they are coming from a place of universality and that is why we can all relate to it. And that is why it is so powerful for us. Um, I would actually like to phrase this in an opposite way and say that the stories of abstraction and the stories of color are coming from a place of cultural specificity, but we as humans have the power to relate powerfully or to relate strongly to stories that are not our own, to stories that maybe come from an origin different than ours. So its strength actually comes from specificity, not necessarily universality, um, but that doesn't mean it can't be meaningful to us that it can't do a lot for us. And one of the reasons I want to push that uh, lens of criticality and um, interpretation upon painting is that as much as I dearly love standing in front of a Clifford Still and having what I call Rorschach interpret, uh, discussions, I feel like there's so much more left to say. And when I say Rorschach interpretations, I mean, we stand in front of the painting and I say, this looks like falling leaves. And the person next to me says, this looks like crashing waves. And we're like, well, I guess we're both right. You know, and there's nothing wrong with those discussions. They're so enjoyable. And I love looking at a painting and saying, this is what it looks like to me. What does it look like to you? I am by no means wish to invalidate the pleasure of those kinds of conversations. But I think there is an impetus right now to push the discussion of abstract expressionism forward in new directions. 
And in order to do that, we're going to look at how artists in 2020 and 2021 are using a lens of cultural specificity towards abstraction. And I would argue it would benefit Clifford still to apply that same lens of cultural specificity. So Diani Whitehawk is Lakota. Um, she is, this work from 2020, um, draws from Lakota origins in numerous ways. On the one hand, the triangle, which is an allusion to the spiritual portal. Um, on the other hand, the turquoise is culturally specific. It is a deliberate homage to the, the metalwork and handicraft made by women in the US. And then if we could go to the next slide. Um, this slide is a bit blurry, I apologize, but I wanted you to see some details in the strokes of this Diani Whitehawk painting, because if you'll notice, her approach to blue is done in many, 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 many small, uh, small, intimate, tiny, thin strokes. Now those thin strokes are deliberate references to quill work, the Native American tradition of quill work, and specifically the female Native tradition of quill work, that quiet labor. So the part of the title of the piece is She Gives, that is an allusion to what the what earth provides, earth being a mother, uh, mother of a figure, also what women provide, a salute to women's work. And so by using those small, tiny, intimate strokes in emulation of quill work, she her formal touch is an homage to the work of Native American artists. And I juxtapose this with, I apologize, a bit blurry image of the brushwork in Big Blue to say, this is Diani's work coming at it from the perspective of a Lakota woman. Clifford still is uh, coming to his brushwork from the perspective of an American white male. What does that mean? How do we interpret that? It's not the only way to interpret it, but when he um, uses his palette knife and there's that roughness, there's this, this aspiration to shamanistic thought, does it, how, how does that perspective change when we think of it through the lens of whiteness? Does it change our perspective? I just think these are questions that haven't yet been um, asked in depth. Um, so the next uh, art painting I wanna share with you is a work by Eamon Orejiron. So this work is called Infinite Regress CL. Um, uh, that's a Roman numeral. Don't ask me what Norman, what Norman numeral, but uh, also from 2020. And in this case, he's also using the color blue painting on raw linen um, and as well as the color gold and different browns. Now, just as Diani Whitehawk is drawing upon being Lakota uh, in her use of turquoise, Eamon Orejiron, uh, he is born in Tucson, so American native, uh, uh, born in the US. Um, his family comes is, has Irish origins and Peruvian origins. And as an artist, he's interested in exploring histories of abstraction in the Americas that come from the Inca, from the, from the Maya, from the, from the Moche, um, from the Aztec. And so his uses of turquoise are informed by pre-Columbian legacies. And his use of gold is informed by this heavy um, historical burden of being the material that motivated colonization. What does it mean to be an artist uh, a Latinx artist and work in the, in the color gold and work in the color blue, the color associated with the minerals and materials of uh, associated with the history of abstraction in the Americas. I show these two artists to you, actually on the one hand to acknowledge these are artists that uh, are living, working today. They're well aware of the history of abstract expressionism. Um, Diani Whitehawk, for example, deliberately cites abstract expressionist artists as an influence upon her work. Um, the difference uh, is, there, or maybe something that they bring to the table, is that they're saying their influence is important upon the history of painting, but they're certainly not where the history of abstraction began. The history of abstraction in the Americas began centuries ago. It did not begin mid-century, uh, mid-20th century. It did not begin with the abstract expressionists. It goes back so much further. And Diani Whitehawk uh, uh, had this amazing quote, which essentially argued that the first color field painters were the Navajo blanket makers. And here um, in this work by Eamon Orejiron, he's essentially putting forward the first abstract, uh, geometric abstract sculptors were pre-Columbian. They, they were not of the 20th century. So what does it mean to interact with the history of painting and fold in an American legacy, a truly American legacy that goes back so much further? It doesn't necessarily take away from the value and innovation of the abstract expressionists but it puts it on a timeline that is so much deeper and so much longer. And I would argue 
gives us more tools to understand what they're doing. Um, so the next artwork I'd like to share with you is that of um, a piano used by the artist Jason Moran. Now, Jason Moran um, is African-American. Um, he's actually um, a, a, as well known, if not more well known for his work in jazz. He's an incredible jazz musician. He's a MacArthur genius for his innovations in jazz. Um, he's also a visual artist and a performing artist. Um, and I will share that this fall, we will have an exhibition of his work at MCA Denver um, called Bathing the Room with Blues. So if you're interested in Jason Moran, you'll have an opportunity, I should say in the future, eventually to see all of these artists, Diani, Eamon, Jason, um, through our exhibition program. Um, what I'm showing you here is a piano, a Steinway that Jason Moran deconstructed during the summer of 2020 while we were all in deep quarantine. Um, so uh, Jason Moran as a performing artist could no longer travel. He could no longer um, perform publicly his, work, his works in jazz. Um, so uh, he went to the woods of Connecticut, took apart a Steinway piano, covered the Steinway piano in blue pigment, laid paper on top of the, key, uh, the keys of the piano, um, covered his fingers in pigment and then um, began to play. So the artworks that result from this process and the next slide shows, basically shows you a detail of the keys um, thickly covered in this intense blue pigment that reminds you of that ultramarine, right? This is a synthetic ultramarine, but, um, but evocative of that. Um, and so the next work you're seeing is, uh, or next slide is the product of his uh, essentially run, um, performing what he call, what's called an attack of his fingers upon the keys. So what you're seeing are the traces and residue of his fingers upon um, uh, the paper that was overlaid on the keys. So in other words, it's the residue of a performance. Now, blue is a color that Jason, is a, Jason Moran is attracted to because of the healing properties um, it, within the legacy of African uh, spirituality and African abstraction. But blue has yet another meaning to him. And as, as a musician deeply steeped in the history of jazz, blue carries the connotations of African, the, the, le, the incredibly deep and rich history of African uh, and Black, African American and Black music in the United States. So the idea of the blues being an innovation that was brought over, born of, of, of slaves brought to this country um, who you know, were uh, allowed to play in Congo Square. And from there, there came this uniquely American medium born of oppression and sorrow um, that, uh, that black culture claim, can claim right, rightfully as their own. Um, a history that is alive and well, and yet needs to be actively preserved. Um, a lot of his work is about bringing us back to that history, reminding us how it was born, who were the innovators, and how do we capture that incredible ineffable moment of live music being played in a space and what are the traces of that? What is, what is the mark making associated with that music coming to life? And how do we mark it and how do we remember it? It's no accident that this work is created in homage and also to all the performers that suffered during 2020 during the pandemic closures and the jazz clubs would shut their doors forever due to the strictures of pandemic. Um, there's even a club here in Houston, a beloved one, El Chapultepec, which had to shutter at doors in December um, due to um, you know, the crisis associated with the pandemic. So in other words, there's active work to be done um, to preserve these histories. So blue obviously, and blue notes, the idea of the melancholy, the minor chords, um, also being another association Jason brings to the idea of blue. So what does that mean? Next slide. Um, when we go back and think of blue for Clifford Still. So I, I am by no means an expert on Clifford Still, but I'd like to bring that idea of if we can think about cultural festivity, how does that um, color, no pun intended, our understanding of his work. Um, this was an artist who had a, a, a stated fascination with uh, Native American culture. He, as we all know, um, as established an artist colony on a Native American reservation, the Colville Reservation um, in, the, in the Northwest. Uh, with, uh, he, he documented the ne Nez Pelham tribe. He um, was described by Rothko as an ethnographer and a shaman, and he liked that um, association. So, um, and there's even a really interesting text by David Anfam about how he was drawn to the idea of 
the Native American idea of fusing spirituality with artistic production and thinking of art in a spiritual sense. Um, I bring all this to bear because there is a quote that I find obviously problematic by Clifford Still, uh, where he said, my work is not influenced by anybody. Well, you know, now with the lens of 2020, we can go look back and say, okay, that probably wasn't true. There were probably many sources of influence, even sources of influence that he did acknowledge in his lifetime. So in part, we are tr in trying to deconstruct the idea of the single genius that is part of our agenda, no doubt. Um, but if we look at his sources of influence, is, is that helpful to us? So, and, 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 I, and I argue that it in no way dilutes the power of the work. Um, I would say both Diani and Eamon acknowledge their decision to work in painting is working in a quote unquote Western medium, right? A one with a, a Western history and yet they are making it their own. They are taking it to another place by bringing other lineages to bear and intersecting those lineages with that Western history. So what does it mean for an artist like Clifford Still who's coming from a Western lineage looking towards Native American culture, looking in the other direction? How do we put that forward towards our understanding of Big Blue? So I'd like to close basically by a close look at this painting. Um, so uh, Katie is now going to guide me um, in a, uh, one of the amazing tools on the website of uh, um, the Clifford Still Museum where we're able to look closely at the painting. Um, so I find this tool to be um, so helpful to get a close look at the painting. Um, of course, it doesn't quite approximate, it can't approximate the real thing, but it's pretty good, it's pretty solid. And um, one idea that I had, again, not being a Clifford Still scholar, but sort of um, drawing from where was Clifford Still in this moment in 1951? This was an artist that was prizing in many ways the idea of freedom. He, he broke with Betty Parsons gallery, broke with quote unquote, his relationship with the art world, was moving towards um, being a more secluded artist, not wanting to tangle with uh, critics and the art market in the ways that he had, wanting to um, define himself. So freedom being something he was seeking at this moment that he painted big blue. Um, freedom, of course, within the context of being a white male. We're not talking about freedom from segregation. We're talking about a very specific idea of freedom. Um, and uh, so, but how does that affect our understanding of the work? Um, so when I look at this work, and this is my interpretation, I think about what are, how do I bring that idea of aspiring for, for freedom, aspiring, uh, looking for opening, looking for breathing space. And when I looked at the blue passages, and I should say one of the wonderful qualities of Clifford Still's work you can enjoy is that any single color is actually the, the buildup of many colors, right? So it took many layers of different colors to get the shades of blue that we're seeing. And when you look at passages of blue, so for example, to um, the right, um, it's a bit difficult to see in this image, but I felt like there were breathing spaces within the blue. So in other words, there are these undulating passages of deeper blues with openings of uh, lighter shades and less intensity. And I saw this in comparison to his works in raw linen, where there, there was lots of exposed raw linen and lots of quote unquote breathing space between where he laid down colors and when, where raw linen was exposed. And um, I say this to say that even within the realm of blue on blue, there's this idea of space and breathing, right? It's not, it's not flat, it's not uniform, it's not matte. There's certainly this, this diversity of um, intensity and color, which allows you to, which gives this blue an incredible feeling of depth, right? It is, um, I, I would, for me, it is compar a compar comparative to looking at the night sky in that there's an incredible richness of um, sense of passages within the blue on blue. The next thing I wanted to point out is this strip, strip of black, right? Um, right into, in the center. Um, and I know that many of the discussions on Clifford Still talk about these lines as abstractions of the figure. And I think that is an absolutely valid interpretation and one that makes sense. He's an artist that, as we know, worked figuratively for and saw his own career within this uh, trajectory of figuration to abstraction. I think what's interesting though, with the benefit that Clifford still did not have, we have this benefit of seeing a longer trajectory of painting. I do wanna say that, you know, it's so interesting to see that the line between figuration and abstraction and is a back and forth, right? Or a simultaneous 
now in 2021, we don't see figuration and abstraction as mutually exclusive. Artists can work in both veins, go back and forth, et cetera. This, for me, this passage of Black, if you're thinking of this painting encapsulating a moment of freedom and breakthrough, for me, it almost looked like a door ajar, right? Um, so not a door flung open, but a door ajar. And Black being this, to me, always a fascinating cousin to Blue. Um, they're both deep colors. And certainly at, there are moments at, when you look at a night sky when you might see black um, or you, in, as opposed to blue because the darkness is so intense. Um, but even within this black, it's of course, it's, it's covered still, so it's not just black. There's a jaggedness to the edges of the black. I like a, you know, a deliberate, um, he didn't want it to be clean breaks with the blue. There's these small areas where blue and black overlap. So it's not that they're discrete, but this black, there's almost like a parting to me, an opening, not an, not a, not freewheeling opening, but just enough, just enough to get through, just enough to keep going. I'm going to break with Betty Parsons, but I'm going to continue uh, making my practice. And by the way, I'm not trying to over project his biography onto it. This is just one lens to think about the painting. Um, next, I wanted to look at this strip of orange, um, right in the painting. So you have the cousin of blue black, and then you have its opposite on the color wheel, you have orange. Orange is as far away from blue as you can get on the color spectrum. And uh, for me, it's this moment of fire. I, uh, there's this, as uh, fans of Clifford still know, there's this uh, idea that you turn the lights off, the paintings will glow with their own fire. They'll burn, I'm, I think I'm mis slightly misquoting it, but the idea that you could turn the lights off, the paintings will still glow. They're, they have their own light. And this moment of orange is sort of that assertion of light, this spark of life. Um, this, uh, you know, rage against the dying of the light. Um, and I love that on the one hand, he's at home with darkness, he's in, at home with the night, and yet there's this, 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 this note, this thread, this, this tone of resilience, this breakthrough. And to me, I also actually think of it as a door ajar, but almost like seeing a door cracked at night. So you're, you're in your bed asleep, but you see the door cracked, you see that there's light on the other side. Um, for me, not to project too much 2021 onto it, but that's a, to me a metaphor for 2020 in general, this idea we're in the darkness, there's a little bit of light on the other side, but it's just a crack, just enough to maybe give us enough fodder to keep on living until we get through it. Um, and then lastly, I want to mention there's a strip of uh, raw linen on the far left of the piece. And um, I think this strip of uh, exposed raw linen that he left, um, deliberately as part of the work is important to note um, because, uh, well, I should say there's a great quote by Eamon Orejiron, one of the painters I showed you, that he says, I like raw linen, I like leaving it exposed because it always reminds you of the physicality of painting. So in other words, this is, this is a thing, right? It's not, it, it's, it's not a chalkboard, it's not a digital uh, file, it's an actual painting. And that raw linen brings you back to the, to the physicality of this thing being an object, right? I am a painter. I'm not something else. I'm a painter. And so leaving the, 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 that material exposed to me is the way of bringing you back. You're not looking at a night sky. You're not looking at something that is something else. You're looking at a painting. Um, so I never like to leave paintings um, in a place of equivalence. I never like to say, well, if you um, understand blue as night or sun as the yellow as a sun, then you're good. You've understood it. There's also there's always, as I said at the beginning of my talk, the ineffable, right? The X factor, something that makes it art and not something else that can't be described in words. So I hope that while I've put forward the idea of cultural specificity, this hasn't this has expanded and not limited your ability to spend time with Big Blue and think of it um, expansively. So I'll stop there and I welcome your questions and welcome the discussion. Thank you so much, Miranda. We've already had a couple questions come up in our Q&A. People are really enjoying your perspectives. Um, so I just wanted to start with one um, about your approach to looking at a painting like this. And if I'm understanding the, the question correctly, and please jump in if you ask this question, um, how do you actually approach the looking? Where do you begin? How do your eyes move? Is this something that you're consciously thinking about as you're looking at work like this? 
Yeah, that's such a great question. Um, I had an, so I will say um, I had an amazing professor in graduate school, Mark Simpson, and one of the exercises he would do with us is actually require that we would look at when we we're trying to look deeply and closely, we would set our watches and spend at least five to 10 minutes with the work. Um, which is actually harder to do than you think. You think, oh, five minutes, that will go so quickly. Um, but it actually can, and even if you go for 10, even longer, it goes more slowly than you would think. Um, the reason you do that is because there are things that will reveal themselves in minute four that you didn't see in minute two. And there are things that reveal themselves in minute six that you didn't see in minute four and so on. Um, I really see paintings as you know, a, a sort of almost a slowly opening peony in the sense that uh, the longer you look, the more it will give you. So when it's time for me to do a deep analysis, I really try to just do that work of sitting for a while with it. Um, I think that looking can be up close and far away. I think you need to do both. I think you need to take in the painting in its entirety. What is it saying to you when, you're, when it's having to shout at you from across the room? How does that feel? What is it trying to convey from across the room? This is an ambitious painting. Um, this is a statement in Clifford Still's work. It's not a minor work. This is really him trying to encapsulate who he is as an artist. So it's meaningful to me to know it was meaningful to him. And then I love close looking in the sense of literally as close as is safe and permissible, um, looking at, at the touch, the texture, how is the paint laid down? Um, so, you know, for me, I love seeing, oh, it's a palette knife. I can see how he's using the palette knife. I love looking at paintings from the side. Is there a lot of impasto or is it laid down thinly? Um, is the painting giving me anything by noticing its depth? Is the painting in good condition or bad? Being a museum person, I can't help but notice it. By the way, it's an excellent condition. Um, I love seeing these moments of fussiness around the black borders of this work where he's, you know, he's sort of like how much, you know, like really working those boundaries between blue and black and then black and orange. And there's, I love these moments in the painting where the orange gets a bit scrumbly, right? It's, it's orange with red, it's with yellow and sort of like building it up, but how much, just enough, not too much. And um, just looking at those passages of careful working. Um, and then if you have the luxury of it, visiting the painting several times uh, in different moments during the day. So um, there's beautiful um, filtered and uh, indirect natural light at the Clifford Still Museum. And so you have the benefit of seeing it, if you like, morning versus afternoon uh, versus late afternoon. And um, it's a slightly different painting every time. Every painting is because they're objects. They're, you know, you're seeing, your light is seeing, the, your eyes are seeing a reflection of light on it in real time. So it won't be the same work um, every time you go. Um, so just trying to take all this to, into account, um, acknowledging how it makes me feel. I mean, that's just kind of one of those first questions you ask when you're, when I was, I mean, I, I, I've done docent tours for many years. So how is it making me feel overall? Um, and then the last piece, hopefully after you've done a lot of listening is, listening to the work, looking at the work. Um, what do I have to say about it? What can I contribute to the discussion that has maybe not already been said? And that's where your research can marry with how, what you've gotten out of being physically with the piece. Thanks, Miranda. That was a really wonderful answer to that question. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if actually for the next question, we might want to pull up the image again, mm -hmm. uh, just for reference, because it is really specific to the painting. Um, this question comes from Fletcher, and he asks, um, I wonder if you think the linen on the left is opening the rest of the blue, or is the blue closing off the linen? Mm. Is it which so who's encroaching upon who who's Who's the invader? That's such an interesting um, uh, question. I mean, arguably, it's you could say it's the light coming in, it's the breaking dawn. Um, I, I guess because I know that it's blue up, blue on linen. I always think of the blue as overtaking the blue being the the more active element. Um, but that's a good point. I guess you could read it the other way uh, that it's it's um, that it's the light coming in. Um, I will say, you know, Clifford still was obviously a master of color. And so I think by allowing that bright, the brightness of the raw linen, the contrast of the raw linen, it is a device to make you realize how blue this painting is. So in other words, we as humans, we see culture, 
color in comparison, right? Um, and so sometimes colors look warmer, cooler, what have you, simply based off what they're next to. And by having that streak of, uh, it's not quite white, it's, you know, it's that, that cream of raw canvas. Nevertheless, it does enhance the intensity um, of the blue simply through the act of contrast. And vice versa, it enhance, the blue enhances the intensity of the white, I guess, arguably. Thanks, Miranda. Um, we have a question about you, actually, from Stephanie. She wants to know, um, do you paint? And if so, um, what you're working on right now? Oh, that's a great question. I have a disappointing answer, um, which is no, I, I do not paint. Um, I've always described myself as strictly fangirl. Um, I'm an art historian. I've, I've never um, uh, called myself an artist. I, I have taken classes in art, just, but really that's more for me to understand the technical aspects of it, for me to, as an art historian, be able to articulate some understanding of how, how a drawing was made, how a painting was made, how a photograph was made. So I come at it from that perspective. Um, I'm not saying it's better or worse than someone who's a practitioner, but I'm, I'm strictly fangirl. I am not um, someone who makes art. Thank you. I didn't know the answer to that question. So that was, that was <laughs> interesting to hear too. Um, another question from Susan. So she asks, um, Thinking of freedom regarding Big Blue and where Clifford still was in his career, the authority of mark making and boldness of his decision of leaving the art world, the blue is an excellent choice to exemplify that freedom. Do you see a correlation between his choice of blue and his personal choices at that time? I do, I do, but I, but I will say, you know, um, so I have an incredible colleague, uh, Dr. Zhang Wu Kim, who is a professor at Carnegie Mellon, and he, we, we are always in dialogue with each other, and he is always schooling me to not let biography be a driving force in your interpretation, or the only force, um, you know, because, you know, his argument is, now that art lives in the world, our interpretation is just as valid as the artist's intent. Um, Nevertheless, I think because um, I associate blue with, you know, expansiveness and freedom because of the, you know, it's associated with the sky, with ocean, with open space. Um, and I know that uh, Clifford Still as an artist often painted big skies, open spaces throughout his career or the idea of the expanse. I think that's one interpretation. I think for me, it's just acknowledging the specificity of 1951 as a breakaway moment, um, you know, he had the privilege of being able to, to have that breakaway moment and continue his practice. Um, and that privilege was born of having made some really great sales and having been successful in his career onto that moment. Um, if, if, you know, if, you, if he hadn't had that success and hadn't had that access, the option of breaking away wouldn't have been there, but he used his success to basically leverage his freedom and move, you know, practice the way he wanted to practice. So that's how I, it's just one way of interpreting it. Thanks, Miranda. From, with all the perspectives you've shared and different angles on the interpretation of Clifford Still's work, I'm like dying to have a conversation with you now about our interpretation at the Clifford Still Museum of these paintings. Um, so maybe we'll have to have a part two of this conversation at some point. Um, it looks like we just have one um, final question um, in the chat for you. Um, and this is about contemporary art. So a great way to close the conversation with you. Um, Stephanie asks, do you think the year 2021 will result in breakaway moments for modern day artists? If so, how? Well, hopefully, um, you mean like their careers taking off um, and being successful? Um, you know, I think a lot, you know, a lot is gonna roar back to life and uh, is roaring back to life in 2021. Museums are reopening. Um, I don't want to downplay uh, the hardships that um, artists have experienced uh, over, due to the COVID pandemic. We know through extensive national surveys that over 90% of practicing artists experienced loss of income um, and loss of livelihood over the last year um, through the, all the closures of venues, through the closures of patronage, through the loss of jobs. So it's been an incredibly rough year for artists. The art market is starting to come back, you know, where there was freeze just a couple weeks ago, uh, limited capacity, but nonetheless, um, I think that um, what I do worry a little bit about is I think the art market is going to pick up 
strong as ever. The auctions are going to be strong as ever. So I think if you're an established artist, you probably are going to no, I don't want to downplay the difficulty, but you might be able to pick up more or less where you left off. But there are emerging artists and younger artists that lost critical time during that period. Or, you know, if you're if artists who are parents that lost critical time because their childcare evaporated, um, or they had to care for another relative, or all the struggles that we've all gone through through 2020. Um, so I don't, I want to recognize that um, just as we see a stratification of recovery based off economic status and other demographic uh, things. There, there is an economic stratification for artists too, in terms of where they were in their career, how far had they made networks already, had they solidified those networks, did they have those systems of support to fall back on? Um, or did it, did things you know, come to a bit of a crashing halt for a moment and can it revive? Um, I will say on a more optimistic note that um, so many museums and so many arts institutions, um, both commercial and nonprofit, are having very active discussions regarding inclusion and equity. Not that we, we will get it all right, but we are, I have never in my entire career seen it, ha seen it happen on an industry-wide scale. Um, so the fact that it's happening industry-wide um, and people are being held accountable, I actually think bodes incredibly well for artists um, because you know, the thing about pursuing equity is that it benefits everyone everyone benefits from improved systems of transparency and awareness. Um, so, um, so in that sense, I feel actually optimistic, hopefully, about where we're going to go in the future in our relationships with artists, how we're gonna be able to care for them, how we're gonna be able to serve them and show their work. Um, so in that sense, I think there's a lot to look forward to, certainly a lot we've learned, and that's why we need artists. We need artists to help us process the intense experience that we've all been through. Um, so I am excited to see what's gonna be born of processing these moments. Mm, I love that answer. And I love closing on that really uplifting note. Thank you, Miranda. And thank you so much for being here with us tonight and sharing your perspectives on still this painting interpretation, the lens of whiteness. I mean, this was just really so incredible. Um, I also want to say thanks to our staff behind the scenes making this program possible and to all of you for joining us on this beautiful Thursday night.